the Zohar reading on Shabbos Cholamoid uh, uh, is actually going to be in Parsha Shmos, uh, in, sorry, in Sefer Shmos, in Parsha Kisisa, and starting on Shlishi. If you look on page, uh, um, on page uh, 504, and, and uh, this is what we're going to be laning this Shabbos. The Cholamoid lanings are different Cholamoid, but Shabbos Cholamoid, we're going to be reading this part. Now this begins with Moshe going up and asking t- Hashem to, 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 to see Hashem. The reason we read this, then we get to the 13 attributes. Eventually we're going to get to the, this is right after the golden calf, where Moshe, is, Moshe goes up, and we, we learned this a few weeks ago. And then they go to the 13 attributes of 508, and the reason we read all of this is because there are going to be seven aliyahs, and the, what the last aliyah, or the second to the last aliyah, is going to include um, Pesach, which is... Uh, Going to show up on page, uh, here it is on page 512. Right? And it's going to be on page 512. It's going to talk about the holidays. It actually starts on page 510. So we're going to lane that whole piece, as Chagamatsu, starting from, from uh, three lines from the bottom. As Chagamatsu, Tishmor, Shivas, Yomim, Tochamatsu, right there at the bottom. The seventh Chagamatsu, you show. Keep seven days, you shall eat matzos, etc. You see that? So because we're going to be reading the Pesach, uh, Pesach is included, so we start from here. Now, obviously, there's a reason we're including Moshe Rabbeinu going up and seeing HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But the, 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 the way it's structured is to include Pesach, a, a reference to Pesach. That's this. So that, that is what we're going to be reading on, on Shabbos. Now, I want to tell you something very interesting about Pesach. The whole idea of what Pesach is and what Pesach is about, and then we'll call it a day, we'll call it a month, we'll call it a year. What's a day? Is day set game set match? <laughs> you have a relationship between the Jewish people and Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Mm-hmm. and the relationship between the Jewish people and Hakadosh Baruch Hu is metaphorically, Hashem is the is the husband and Klal Yisrael is the wife. That in the Song of Songs you see that, and we see that all the time in the, uh, uh, the allegorical relationship of the connection of the, of the, of the Shekhinah, the some divine presence, and, and, and Kla Yisrael. That Hashem, you see there's in the male-female relationship, we always talk about things, I don't know what, the, I don't know what yin and yang is exactly, but <laughs> it sounds good. But there's, <laughs> there is the, the force, and there, there's the giver, and there's the receiver. What we call in Hebrew the mashpia and the mishpat, the one who is the energy and the one who receives the energy. So obviously in the male-female relationship, the male is the mashpia. The woman is the receiver. The male is the mashpia. He's, the, he's the, 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 the energy of the woman is the receiver of the energy. Ultimately, every single thing you do in life is a mashpia. If you, if, you stab your, if you take a fork and stick it into some spaghetti, that's a force and that's the receiver. That's what you do. If you pick up a cup, your hand is forced. The cup is on the receiving end. Everything that you, if you hit a bat, if you swing a baseball bat, you know you're swinging the bat. Is there? There's a mashpi and there's a nishpa and every every single thing in life. So in Klai Yisrael, obviously, Hakadosh Baruch Hu is the mashpi. Hakadosh Baruch Hu is the male. Klai Yisrael is the female. That because Klai Yisrael is the receiving the energy from Hakadosh Baruch Hu. So we have a remarkable, remarkable sequence of events in the Jewish year. You have first of all uh, Pesach which is when the Jewish people were actually chosen in Egypt. Kosh Baruch Hu takes the Jewish people, and that's called the betrothal. The Jewish people is the betrothal. In, in Halacha, there's the first stage of marriage is called Kedushin. The tractate Kedushin that we learned, Kedushin. Kedushin is betrothal. It's Halachic betrothal. It's not what we call nowadays, there's a couple gets engaged. That just means that they made an announcement in the, in the local Jewish chronicle that they're engaged, you know, and, and, and he bought her a diamond ring. You know, that's why they're engaged. It has zero halachic, it has zero halachic, uh, 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 what do you call it? Vil- ramifications. ramifications. Thank you. It has zero halachic ramifications. When a couple gets married under the chuppah, then he gives her a ring under the chuppah. And the ring that he gives her under the chuppah is much cheaper than the, than the engagement ring. They get the engagement ring is usually a diamond. And our, 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 our minhug is to give the girl under the ring, under the chuppah, the one that really counts, you give her a plain band, a plain, sometimes silver, or a, usually a silver band or a gold band, 
that she shouldn't have, you see the problem with giving a diamond is that the girl might think that the diamond's worth more than it really is. So it might be a false transaction. She, she figures, okay, I'll marry this guy because he's giving me some serious bucks over here. Where in fact, uh, where in fact uh, so in order that there should be any deception, we give her a plain band and she understands that a plain band's got a certain limit on how much it could possibly be worth. That's the, that's the idea. Now, under the chuppah, the first stage is what we call halachic betrothal, which is kedushin, or otherwise known as erusin. At that point, a woman enters a state of limbo. On the one hand, she is the 100% status of a married woman. That means if another man were to live with her, that couple is committing adultery, as opposed to a single girl, where it would just simply be an act of immorality, where from a halachic point of view, there's a major difference because uh, uh, the difference would be, what do you call it, the difference is, uh, is capital punishment if they're witnesses. So, so at the point that under the chuppah, he says, Hare at mikudeshes li, she is officially a arusa, she's betrothed halachically, has all of the status of a married woman, except for one thing. Her husband can't live with her, the couple can't live together. They're not married yet. They're betrothed, they're not married. That's halachic betrothal. The next step is and that generally when you go to a wedding, you'll see that they then read the chuppah. They, they don't read the chuppah. You read the chuppah, that's pretty, pretty. They read the ksuba. They read the, the, the marriage document in order to make a separation between the first stage and the second stage, which is the next seven brachos, which is where they actually are now married. They are now married. They are officially married, husband and wife. The, uh, in the old days, at the time of the Gemara, it took a year between each stage. So they would do Kedushin, then they would wait a year so they could equip themselves to get married so they could get financially set up and so on and so forth in order to get, in order to get, uh, in order to get what he called get ready for marriage. That was the, uh, that's what happened at the time of the Gemara. So that means for an entire year, this is a woman who's got married status, but they're not living together. That way the husband and wife could then supply themselves with whatever they need to get married, the money, whatever finances, then they would get married. Then there's Kedushin. Then there's, sorry, Nisuin. Nisuin is the marriage where the couple is now officially married. Now, if you take a look at the course of the Jewish year, we start out with Pesach, the three holidays. We start out with Pesach. What was Pesach? What happened Pesach? HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose the Jewish people in, in the desert. HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose the Jewish people. He selected the Klal Yisrael. You are my bride. And then he takes them out into the desert. Lech Teich like a bride follows her husband. I didn't say it's always a smart thing, but she does, right? So the bride follows a, a, a young girl, puts her, her life into some guy's hands, you know, who, who's just been, been the king of Kush, uh, what do you call it, in, uh, in, in, in your terms, you know, and all of a sudden he's now, he's now taking responsibility for somebody else's life. So, so that's called the Erusin. HaKadosh Baruch Hu betrothed Kala Yisrael in Egypt. The next stage is... The next holiday we have is Shavuos. Now what happened at Shavuos? You know, the Gemara says that Hashem held a mountain over the Jewish people's head. Right? What does that mountain symbolize in marriage terms? The chuppah, of course. The mountain symbolizes the chuppah. They had a couple of standing under the chuppah together. So the Shavuos is the marriage between the husband and the wife. Remarkably, what do we do between Pesach and Shavuos? We count 49 days. Right? Sfira Omer. Now, the idea of counting the 49 days is to show us that there's a link between Pesach and Shavuos. That the Jewish people got out of Egypt, but they didn't just get out of Egypt for no reason. They got out of Egypt for a purpose. What was the purpose? To eventually get to, the, to, to Har Sinai to receive the Torah. So, so we're counting. Whenever you count from one thing to another, you're connecting the two things. What do you get? You know, I told you, I think I told you once in, in, in this, I was a kid in the 70s, when there were all these rallies for Russian Jewry. And they quoted the Pasuk that said, let my people go. Like, shlach et ami. There were bumper stickers, shlach et ami, let my people go. And then, uh, shlach et, let, let my, and then they, they came out with the from bumper sticker, which was one more word in the Pasuk that said, shlach et ami, v'yav duty, that they may serve me. Now that's a quote from Moshe Rabbeinu Taparo. Moshe said to Paro, send out my people that they may serve me. As opposed to just send out my people. Because freedom without a purpose is not a good thing. Freedom has to have you free for a reason. Now, the Jewish people could not accept HaKadosh Baruch Hu's sovereignty 
and certainly devote themselves the way we have to devote ourselves on a daily basis to try to serve our Kodesh Baruch as much as we can. The Jewish people couldn't do that because they're enslaved by, by a, a king of flesh and blood. It's very difficult to go put on tefillin when some guy's whipping you and has chained you up. So you can't make it to Minyan on time. You, got, you finally got a good excuse. You know, where were you yesterday for Minyan? Well, I was chained to a pyramid and I was being whipped. You know, what do you want from me? So, so there you got a good excuse. Whereas, whereas so, so the first thing we need to get free from Paro for what purpose? So that we can then take on and accept God's sovereignty. So the connection between Shavuot, Pesach, and Shavuot is the 49 days that we're counting in order to make the connection. That was the goal of our freedom. But it's even more than that. A woman, before she gets married, has to purify herself. Now, how many days is a woman impure by Torah law? Seven days. Seven days. That's after her birth. Seven days. She's impure. When she starts bleeding, she's impure for a minimum of seven days. The seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot, and again, in that, in that metaphorical uh, relationship between God and the Jewish people, the husband and the wife, we get out of Egypt and we were impure. We had sunk into, the, into, into various stages, of, into various levels of impurity in Egypt. They count seven weeks, which represents the seven clean days that a woman must not see any blood. Do, uh, see any blood. And then... She's ready to go to the chuppah, and then they're ready to live together. Shavuos is metaphorically the chuppah uh, between, between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Klai Yisrael. What comes after Shavuos? Then comes after Sukkot. So what does Sukkot represent? Sukkot represents the home that the Jewish people, that the husband and wife are going to build. We go into the sukkah with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We go into the home. So you have Pesach is the betrothal, Shavuos is the chuppah, Sukkot is the, the, the th seven weeks are the period of purification, and then Sukkot represents the home that the couple is going to build. That's the, that's the idea between, that's really what's happening on Pesach, what's happening with all the holidays. There's nothing in Judaism, as, you know, you know, you, you've heard enough to see that every single thing here, there's a, there, there's a method to this madness. There, there's, there's rhyme and reason. So what we're doing on Pesach is, Pesach is actually a celebration in and of itself, but it's a preparation of sorts for the next stage, which is to receive the Torah. <coughs> okay, that's uh, that's it. Any other any questions on that? Any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> oh, go ahead. Okay, just to clarify, so Pesach, Pesach is the is the first stage of the Torah. <coughs> Shavuos is the chuppah, and then Sukkot is the home. So then, the forty nine okay. days between Pesach and Shavuos. Um, is there a connection that that's the pure that corresponds the to the seven weeks it, when you see it seven as seven weeks it represents the seven, seven days, days that a woman has to purify herself correct and where the bride you see these you see that the, this the, there are these illusions all over the place of, uh, of of the relationship between Hashem and the Jewish people as a relationship of a husband and a wife so then to <clears> that to that do you know why do you know why blood has to be Shed. Blood, blood is always a symbol of impurity because, it, because blood is a result of Adam and Chava's first sin. Uh, the original sin caused the blood. Uh, any type of illness or any type of wound is a result of blood. Had they not done the original, there'd be no blood in the world. There'd be no bleeding. There'd be a perfect relationship. Every, every relationship would be perfect. Everybody would be healthy. It's all a result of that. And that's why the, 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 letter, the, the color red is always problematic. Color red, color red shows a problem. Yeah, color red's a problem because red always always is inviting some sort of trouble. Where there's red, there's trouble, and the reason is because the red, the original blood, was red. I just saw recently that had Adam and Chava not sinned, the entire drive, the entire they 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 would have somehow. Uh, they, they they apparently there are birds where the male impregnates the female simply by looking at her. You have some sort of uh, some sort of stimulation. Animals are weird. A lot of weird things happen with animals, and somehow she's stimulated as a result of the male looking at her, and something she's pre-programmed to somehow, therefore, become fertilized. Somehow, you know, however Hakadosh Baruch did it. He had Adam and Chava not sinned originally. That uh, I saw at least one of the commentaries says that would have been the the male-female relationship. Would have been such a high level. In other words, we wouldn't have had. You're, I know you're thinking, well, you know, who wants that? But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it was, it was a, it was a, 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 it would, the, the level, the entire drive wouldn't even be there. 
entire drive would be, the whole thing would be on a much higher level. These, these are concepts beyond our control. But blood represents the impurity. But that, that, that's, where, that's where the blood represents. And the, uh, uh, one of the ideas of a child, of a bris mila being done on the eighth day, is that the child was in the mother's womb and he needs seven days to purify himself for having been in the womb where there's blood. When a commentary says, my, my, we're, we're, my, we, have a, we have a new grandson. I have a new grandson born last Thursday, so next fri Friday we have a, my grandson's bris. So, uh, yeah, so, so, the, uh, the, uh, so I was looking at something on bris mila and the concept of the number eight. But, but you see this relationship all the time, the metaphorical relationship between God, the Jewish people, as the husband and the wife. Because that's, a, that's the ultimate, the ultimate uh, relationship of a mashpia and a That works, obviously works both ways because a woman obviously has a certain, has, a, has an input also, obviously. But as a, as a general relationship, that's the, the giver and the receiver. Yeah. So when Adam and Hava have that reaction of shame in the garden, they're reacting to something that's already built into themselves, right? A potential for a kind of, you know, way of mating that brings to their mind shame. So it sounds like that mode was, was there from the start and it was only their awareness of it that caused them to be shameful, not necessarily a desire that emerged in them that was... I'll tell you the truth. There's a lot of discussion on what happened with Adam and Chava as far as considering that he didn't have a Yetzirah, so how could he possibly sin? And there's all sorts of explanations about about exactly what was they aware of, what they weren't aware of. You know, like you say, you know, and also now they're, now they're ashamed. Yes. Now they're embarrassed. So before, before they weren't embarrassed, which ultimately is going to happen to people in, in the world to come. That's ultimately what's going to be where a person who lives, lives like a, you know, with, with, with no self-control and a person doesn't make an effort to get their act together. So they're going to be a sense of shame. Then they're going to realize the shame mm -hmm. in the world to come. So it could be that that's a throwback already to Adam and Chav. I don't know. I don't know how that works exactly. And I don't believe that, you know, there are all sorts of explanations that are offered. One of the common explanations is that Adam felt that he wants to do something wrong so that he could serve Hashem with free choice and get to a higher level. It was all the shame Shemayim. For the sake of serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he, felt, he felt he wants to get to a point where he now will have the Yetzirah. He'll feel he wants to absorb the evil inclination. He'll eat from the tree so he can absorb the evil inclination and have to get through, fight and battle with his evil inclination free choice. That way he could serve Hashem at a higher level. Which is all very noble, except for one problem. What's the problem? Uh, told him not to do it. I should have said, don't do it. That was the only problem. Everything is good. Everything is wonderful. I heard about there was a guy. There was a bank robbery, and the the bank teller was the bank teller was a former linebacker in college, hmm. and the guy the guy came in. He went over the counter after the guy. The guy came into the bank. And the guy he pulled a gun, and the guy went over the counter after. Him, so the guy ran, and he ran down three blocks, and he finally tackled him. They called the cops and turned him in. And the next day he gets called in by the president of the bank because he's going to get an award, you know, he's a hero. He goes in, the president of the bank, he looks at him and he says, you're fired. He says, why? He says, we have very clear instructions in the bank that if there's a holdup, you turn over the money and you don't do anything other than that because you could cause some guys start shooting and cause injuries to yourself or to any of our customers and so on and so forth, and therefore you broke the gang rules, you're fired. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything you did was wonderful. There's only one problem, I told you not to do it. So you can have, the, what is it? There's an expression, the highway to Gehenna is, paved with good intentions. No, my intentions are good. Okay, intentions are good, but I intended you not to do it. There's that line where, uh, you know, Adam, you, he almost accuses Hashem. It's like the woman, you You do, you got me right. And that, so it's, that's his the Gamar, Well, the Gemara says over there that you see that Adam, Adam over there was an ingrate. Yeah. You know, you got, and he was, oh. he's an ingrate. You know, he gave him a wife. And the Gemara refers to a wife as essentially a, 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 a shifra, which is like a maidservant. She does everything for you. She cooks, she cleans, she carries, she does everything for you. And because, and for that, that, that you're catching about that. You're well, catching. I, I, my, my thing there was that maybe he thought that she was the messenger that was somehow communicating. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Messenger. I, I, I only know from. I only know from sin. You know, <laughs> she messed them over. That's all. You know, and we've been we've been we've been trying to make up for it ever since. That's all I know. And, and every time you give your wife your credit card, you have to think this wouldn't be happening if not for that original sin, because we'd be in God aid and eating for free. <laughs> and the only reason I'm working is because of you, lady. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, so what do you call it? That, that, that was, that's what they, oh, it's a wonderful philosophical approach. If I told you, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that could be, that's one lesson to take out of it. What you say could be another lesson to take out of it. But at the end of the day, that's not, uh, that's not, we, we do what we're told. Not, don't do what, don't do what you think, don't, don't do what you want to do. Do what you, do what you're told to do. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's right. And that's a good lesson in life. All right, gentlemen, I go wish you a chag kosher v'sameach. Just one last reminder, don't go into the Seder hungry. Make sure on the day, wherever you are, where are you guys going to be for the Seder? You're going to be by some Israeli salmon setting you up? You're going to be somewhere? Yeah. Wherever you go, don't, don't be hungry when you go in. Otherwise, you won't enjoy it. Because sometimes you can go to, you say, first of all, this year it starts very late. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what, time that you what time you could anticipate eating, gentlemen. Because the Seder is going to start. Erev Pesach, let's see. Shkia is at 7.05, which means Marv won't be till 7.45. No, Marv will be about 7.35. 7.35... 7.35 uh, will be Marv. Marv's going to take about a, at least a half hour. 8.05, until uh, you get back to your host, it's going to be at least 8.30, closer to probably to 9 o'clock till you even start. You're not going to be starting your satyrs before 9 o'clock, right? And then if you have a guy who's uh, fairly... Uh, Fairly, uh, in, fairly talkative. Uh, uh, he may go on for a while. You might not be eating matzah till eleven o'clock at night. Right? My seder starts at nine. I'm eating not matzah probably about nine fifteen. You know, but uh, no, just kidding, just kidding. Well, it it, it, it kind of you know kind of we kind of move. It. I don't I don't rush, but we certainly don't uh, I don't torture either. But uh, uh, so you you should not go into the seder hungry. You should try to. You're limited on what you could eat because you can't eat any. Uh, can't eat any. What do you call it? Uh, cakes. Cakes or anything like that. But you could eat potatoes, meat, chicken, that sort of thing. Borscht. Huh? Potatoes and borscht. Potatoes and borscht. Well, we don't do that. But uh, yeah, my my Zadie did. My father did. But that's where the line ended. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the line of borscht ended right there. Yeah, the borscht was was, was like the like like the cat's meow. I could knock down the borscht. I can't. Uh, somebody, but then they put in the, the borscht with uh, what do you call it? sour cream? Like, like, like. Oh my goodness! You know, like, like Mashiach's arrived. You know, <laughs> it's like, hey people, it's just borscht and stuff. And my Zadie always drank borscht. Like, like wow, borscht. There's also something they ate. I don't know. Your grandparents probably ate this. Did you ever have gala? You didn't have a gala? All right, gentlemen, hang on. Now hang on to the table for you. You know what gala is? Gala is where you boil cow's feet. And a certain kind of fat. Oh, like the, uh, yes. What? No, 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 Russian is called like no, 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 it's not it's a soup. Soup, it's uh, whatever it's called. <laughs> whatever it's called. <laughs> Them's one nasty idea, <laughs> you know. And apparently, see what Jews. The truth of the matter is because Jews were always looking for something to smear on bread, because they didn't have much. So you had bread with it with some. You had bread with some either oil or margarine, or onions or something, or you had smear it on. So you made, they were always drinking soup and eating, eating something, but they weren't sitting around eating like we were, grew up. When I grew up, when I went to high school, I don't think I ever ate bread during, bread. who ate bread during the week? Why should I, why should he eat bread? It was meat and potatoes. Every night was meat and potatoes. Who's, who's going to eat, who's going to wait? My grandparents, bread, soup, and you know, maybe you got to, maybe you got to the, to the living creature afterwards, you know, but, or the dead creature, whatever the case was. But, <laughs> who ate that stuff? So, so they, they ate practically, you know, you ate a schmear. That's what they. That's what they. That's what they had. But they. They had the, the gala. I mean, I, I have. Ne I've never had the pleasure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to say something else. Your parents also. Your parents, probably not. Your grandparents, for sure. When the, your grandparents were little, they had something called cod liver oil. Oh, I, 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 I love that. Oh, say you're lying. Oh, tell me. <laughs> Only because it's healthy for you. Uh, it's healthy for you. So my father, all of us, all told me when they were little, they. Cod liver oil was gonna was the cure all for everything, mm. and it was was like a black oily. It's a black, like like and it, it, it's yeah. supposed to taste like right. like the devil's like the devil's worst yeah, concoction. It's very, it's very good. <laughs> it's very good. It's from it's supposed to be horrific. And I asked my dad once here yeah, because it's supposed to be healthy. It's like a vitamin wards off all all hills. I said to my dad once. Did, did the adults take it too? He said, no, no, it was only good for kids. <laughs> somehow it was only good for kids. The adults somehow were punter. They didn't have to. They